morning, friends. We are on chapter 97, The Lamp. Had you descended from the Pequod's triworks to the Pequod's forecastle, where the off-duty watch were sleeping, for one single moment you would have almost thought you were standing in some illuminated shrine of canonized kings and counselors. There they lay in their triangular oaken vaults, each mariner a chiseled muteness, a score of lamps flashing upon his hooded eyes. In merchantmen, oil for the sailor is more scarce than the milk of queens. To dress in the dark, and eat in the dark, and stumble in darkness to his pallet, this is his usual lot. But the whaleman, as he seeks the food of light, so he lives in light. He makes his berth in Aladdin's lamp, and lays him down in it, so that in the pitchiest night the ship's black hull still houses an illumination. See with, that with what entire freedom the whaleman takes his handful of lamps. Often but old bottles and vials, though, to the copper cooler at the triworks, and replenishes them there as mugs of ale at a vat. He burns, too, the purest of oil in its unmanufactured and therefore unvitiated state, a fluid unknown to solar, lunar, or astral co contrabances ashore. It is sweet as early grass butter in April. He goes and hunts for his oil so as to be sure of its freshness and genuineness, even as the traveller on the prairie hunts up his own support of game. Chapter 98. Stowing Down and Clearing Up Already, as it has been related, how the great Leviathan is afar off descried from the masthead, how he is chased over the watery moors and slaughtered in the valleys of the deep, how he is then towed alongside and beheaded, and how, on the principle which entitled the headsman of old to the garments in which the beheaded was killed, his great padded surtout becomes the property of his executioner. How in due time he is condemned to the pots, and like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his spermaceti oil and bone pass unscathed through the fire. But now it remains to conclude the last chapter of this part of the description by rehearsing, singing, if I may, the romantic proceeding of decanting off his oil into the casks, and striking them down into the hold, where once again Leviathan returns to his native profundities. Sliding along beneath the surface as before, but alas, never more to rise and blow. While still warm, the oil, like hot punch, is received into the six-barrel six casks, and while perhaps the ship is pitching and rolling this way and that in the midnight sea, the enormous casks are slewed round and headed over, end for end, and sometimes peril perilously scoot across the slippery deck like so many landslides, till at last manhandled and stayed in their course and all round the hoops, rap, rap, go as many hammers as can play upon them, for now ex officioso. officioso Every sailor is a cooper. At length, when the last pine is cast and all is cool, then the great hatchways are unsealed, the bowels of the ship are thrown open, and down go the casks to their final rest in the sea. This done, the hatches are replaced and herme hermetically closed, like a closet walled up. In the sperm fishery, this is perhaps one of the most remarkable incidents in all the business of whaling. One day the planks stream with freshest of blood and oil. On the sacred quarter-deck enormous masses of the whale's head are profanely piled. Great rusty, cask lie, great rusty casks lie about, as in a brewery yard. The smoke from the triworks has besooted all the, all the bulwarks. The mariners go about suffused with unctuousness. The entire ship seems great leviathan himself, while on all hands the din is deafening. But a day or two after, you look about you and prick your ears in this self-same ship, and were it not for the tell-tale boats and triworks, you would all but swear you trod some silent merchant vessel with the most scrupulous, scrupulously neat commander. The unman unmanufactured sperm oil possesses a singularly cleansing virtue. This is the reason why the decks never look so white just after what they call an affair of oil. Besides from the ashes of the burned scraps of the whale, a potent lie is readily made, and whenever any adhesiveness from the back of the whale remains clinging to the side, that lie quickly exterminates it. Hands go diligently along the bulwarks, and with buckets of water and rags restore them to their full tidiness. The soot is brushed from the lower rigging. All the numerous implements which have been in use are likewise faithfully cleaned and put away. The great hatch is scrubbed and placed upon the triworks, completely hiding the pots. Every cask is out of sight. All tack tackles are coiled in unseen nooks, and when, by the combined and simultaneous industry of almost the entire ship's company, the whole of this conscientious duty is at last concluded, then the crew themselves proceed, proceed to their own ablutions, ship themselves from top to toe, and finally issue to the immaculate deck, fresh and all aglow as bridegrooms new leaped from out of the daintiest Holland.
Now with elated step, they pace the planks in twos and threes, and humorously discourse of parlors, sofas, carpets, and fine cambrics. Propose to mat the deck, think of having hangings at the top, hangings to the top. Object not to taking tea by moonlight on the piazza of the forecastle. To hint at such musked mariners of oil and bone and blubber were little short of audacity. They know not the thing you distantly allude to, away and bring us napkins. <laughs> but mark, aloft there, at the three mast heads, stand three men intent on spying out more whales, which, if caught infallibly, will again soil the old oaken furniture and drop at least one small grease spot somewhere, yes, and many is the time, when after the severest uninterrupted labors, which, which no, no night, continuing straight through for ninety-six hours, when from the boat, where they have swelled their wrists all day rowing on the line, they only step to the deck for to carry vast chains and heavy the, and heave the heavy windlass, and cut and slash, yea, and in their very sweatings to be smoked and burned anew by the combined fires of the equatorial sun and the equatorial triworks. When on the heel of all this, they have finally bestirred themselves to cleanse the ship and make a spotless dairy room of it. Many is the time the poor fellows, just buttoning the necks of their clean frocks, are startled by the cry of, There she blows! And away they fly to fight another whale and go through the whole weary thing again. Oh, my friends, but this is man-killing, yet this is life. For hardly have we mortals by long toilings extracted them from this world's vast bulk its small but valuable sperm, and then, with weary patience, cleansed ourselves from its defilements, and learned to live there in clean tabernacles of the soul. Hardly is this done when, there she blows, the ghost is spouted up, and away we sail to fight some other world and go through young life's old routine again. Oh, metempsychosis, oh, Pythagoras, in bright, that in bright Greece, two thousand years ago, did die so good, so wise, so mild. I sailed with thee along the Peruvian coast last voyage, and, foolish as I am, taught thee, a green, simple boy, how to splice a rope. Have a good day, friends.